First of all, thank you to Dieter. Thank you to everyone for having us. Um, I'm not just saying that as lip service. This is a, a dream for us because we set out together, Jim and I beginning, and then with everyone here and, and Emma and Steve who are here, uh, knowing it was the l last time I would play the role, we set out to make a movie that was not defined by genre, that wouldn't be defined by a rating, uh, or wouldn't be defined by previous films in the franchise, but just to make a great movie. The fact we were at the Berlin Film Festival is a dream come true for us, and uh, so thank you. And so, I gotta be honest, when I saw the movie, I was very nervous, knowing what was at stake for me, uh, and I was so, it exceeded my expectations, but I looked at that character, there were some moments I cried in weird places, uh, like carrying Charles Xavier up the stairs, like places, just moments, and I thought I loved that character. And uh, I can't say I'll miss him because it's difficult to describe, it's not going anywhere for me. It's, it will always live here. Uh, the fans will remind me every single day or second day of my life, whether we got it right or wrong. It's, it's part of who I am and it's a journey I'm so, so grateful for. The reason I never hesitated to reach out to Jim Mangold first is because he's a great storyteller. For me, great stories illuminate who we are, our everyday existence. They also make us look at the world beyond ourselves. And Jim immediately came to me saying, let's tell a story about family from the point of view of someone who is terrified of intimacy, as in Logan, and let's set it in a world where you feel things are shifting in a similar dynamic of should we separate or should we connect? Is it safer and easier to just live on your own? Um, or is the messier, sometimes frustrating, even potentially dangerous notion of connecting, should, you know, that's what's at play on the larger tapestry. And I don't, it doesn't matter if it's a horror movie genre, a romantic comedy, a superhero movie, a western. There's no one greater than Jim who knows how to tell a story. And yes, there's resonances. I hope there's resonances. I hope people, it makes them think about their day-to-day -day life. I love that we have a superhero movie where you have a main character looking after an ailing father type figure. Um, where they're in a car and they're going to run out of gas and, oh, damn it, my, my phone is out of charge and I need a battery. You know, like the day-to-day, -day, I'm proud of that. And I hope it does make people think more importantly about violence, the effect of it, the aftermath of it, and, uh, and hope that resonates. One of the things that excites me when I work on a larger film like this is the idea of speaking to a larger audience. And I think for those of us um, working, whether it's in Europe or anywhere abroad or America, making larger films for larger audiences, I think it's important that we not be part of the problem. And what I mean by that is that we not be making movies that help people sleep through their lives. And uh, that, it, that would be the simple point of saying um, it's almost most important that movies that are referencing and using pop culture and our franchises and have very large natural audiences use that platform to do something other than sell Happy Meals or T-shirts or action figures, but actually use that audience to ask some interesting questions. I think a lot of people in this room have seen the film. You can see what an extraordinary actress Daphne is and her performance I'm so proud of. I, I will admit, when Jim first told me the idea of the story, I was like, this sounds awesome, but how the hell are we going to pull that off? You know, this is a, a lot for 11-year-old. Uh, how do we find that? And it was so clear with Daphne. But what you don't know, uh, unless you can intuit from the screen, is, as Jim said, she's an extraordinary young girl. I'm so proud of you, Daphne, and what you've done. But I'm really proud of who you are and how you handle it. And uh, I will always know you as Santi Banke. <laughs> Little bird who jumps. <clears throat> Let me address one, which is that I think that all of us on this stage, for all the children involved in the movie, um, did our level best 
to create an environment of love, which was, came naturally. I made um, three movies with this man. Um, these are both super sweet guys. Uh, uh, Patrick was just reminding me of the many days we spent doing driving scenes where Daphne and Hugh and Patrick would be playing word games and singing in the car. Um, I think it's important to remember that uh, making a movie is very different than watching it. Uh, this is an act that we were together every day having a great time, and I think um, at the same time, um, I felt it responsible uh, to only consider a young people with smart parents who knew how to contextualize what was going on for their kids, and a smart child. In the case of Daphne, she's a kid who um, has grown up around acting and I think has a great deal of understanding of the boundary line between play and reality. In the movie, we see her initially as an enigma and a mystery, and then we learn she is a killing machine. But as the film progresses, and particularly as she comes increasingly under the influence of Hugh's character and mine, we see her understanding the different kind of life that she might have, that it could be a life based on family and based on love. And that is why all of the actions in the movie, as they apply to Daphne's character, are appropriate and optimistic and positive. I grew up uh, reading comics, and specifically X-Men comics were my favorites, so um, working in all these movies, and I've been lucky to work in a few, um, uh, has been uh, an incredible dream. This movie is different than the other movies that we've ever done because of Jim, and, and, and I would say a lot of this came from, from Hugh as well, wanting it to be different and wanting it to be more honest and dramatic and emotional than we've done in these films before. And it was something that we set out to do from the beginning um, uh, with models like Unforgiven and 310 to Yuma and looking at a lot of other Westerns uh, as models and paradigms for the movie more than any other comic book movies or action movies. Um, we really were looking at more patient, dramatic, mature, sophisticated films, um, not knowing whether or not we would be allowed um, to, to do it and, and, and able to execute it uh, in a comic book uh, genre. And, um, and so that was, I think, uniquely Jim is gifted, like he was saying, at being an incredible storyteller, but also an incredible, um, uh, and I guess this is connected to storytelling for a director, incredibly gifted at creating and sustaining tone um, in different genres. Not a lot of directors can do it. Uh, and the great directors like Stanley Kubrick and Billy Wilder, and they work from different genre to genre, and there's a consistency of voice and tone, and, and Jim has that. Um, and, uh, and you had a very clear vision, Jim, from the beginning. Uh, and you were unwavering about it, even as you evolved and the movie evolved. Um, and I think this is the result of that. Jim is a truly remarkable filmmaker and, and brings a level of um, passion, intelligence, thoughtfulness, thoroughness, um, relentlessness to the, the telling of his stories. And at least for me, getting to bear witness to what is an extraordinary evolution as a filmmaker, for me, really kind of coalescing in this production. Um, the, the, the depth in the script, the, the, you know, kind of daily ambition and striving, and as Simon mentioned, and I think Hugh referenced, um, such a, a fluid, uh, an intuitive understanding of the material, and the results uh, were were truly kind of remarkable on every on every day for me, and and incredibly grateful both to Fox, who's well represented here, but but to the the other people on the panel because this is a unique experience as somebody's. We've all gotten to work on a lot of movies, very few like this one. Some of us have been here before. This is my first time, but I think for all of us, this represents. Um, you know, one of the more important events in cinema annually, um, and certainly with the collection of journalists here, it's 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 a it's an aggregation of the world's um, uh, press and the world's opinions. So, on the one hand, you're coming hoping that the reaction will be positive and that that will act as a positive amplifier, but you also run the risk, of course, that that's not the reaction. <laughs> um, I think in in our case, and certainly in Fox's case. You know, we felt a, a, a great deal of uh, pride about the film and, and uh, the hope and belief was that 
that Jim, you know, aspired to tell an, an emotional story, a substantive story, do something, as he said, a little bit different. And, and I think Fox, certainly in, in strategizing together about probably, you know, one of the boldest or most unique ways to try to introduce ourselves to the world, thought the festival was the right, the right venue. So we're, we're pretty thrilled to be here. We are affected by those changing times. And I think it is the same for all artists, no matter which field they work in, that you present your art as an influenced person by those times. You cannot escape from it. We did not set out to make a political movie. And yet there are references and, and echoes in this movie that could not have been anticipated but exist today. That is serendipity. And if people wish to take away from this movie some social or political lessons about the world at large, then I, I think that means that, that we have done perhaps a more subtle job than we thought we had done, but that it's also reaching an audience in a rich and complex way. A year before any of those debates happened, the whole wall and the scenes of the border were in our script, and it was kind of amazing how, and I think it's a sign that Jim and Scott and these guys were onto something. There was just something going on, and that's, that's uh, credit to you. I, I'm just gonna shift a little personally to your question, in that uh, 17 years since, and, and Hutch has been there from the beginning, Patrick there from the beginning. Uh, I remember being very starstruck when I met Patrick Stewart. <laughs> I was at drama school watching the John Barton How to Play Shakespeare tapes, which he stars in, <laughs> and I remember saying, Drunken to one of my friends, oh, one day if I could work with Patrick Stewart or Ian McKellen, and li literally months later I turn up on a set and they're both there. I could barely speak to them. Yeah. Um, Simon from early 2000s, Jim and I first worked together in 2001. But this character has been within me for 17 years, but not until this film do I feel like I've really got to the core of it, to the heart of it. And I'm not blaming anyone, but sometimes it's my fault, sometimes it's just the nature of storytelling, you have 20 characters. But when, I, when Jim and I first got together, I was like, Jim, I, wanna, I want my grandkids to ask me when I'm 80, which one of those movies should I watch? I wanted to say, this is the movie that defines this character. So there was a lot at stake for me and my love for that character, my love of the fans. I feel this movie is a love letter to the Wolverine fans. But beyond that, I wanted to make a movie that someone who's never watched a comic book movie in their life would see and get something out of. So, yes, we grow with the times. I grow with the times. I couldn't have made this movie four years ago. Uh, I couldn't have made this movie without every single person on this uh, table, on this uh, platform, and, and, and same with Emma and Steve and all the market. I, I couldn't have done it because we went outside the box and we asked everyone to come on board and literally every single person said yes within a minute. You said it in two words, one of them was an F word, but <laughs> <laughs> it was instant. And, and it took that kind of group um, uh, enthusiasm, I suppose, and desire to make something real.